Can you please go into more detail of Mongols building civilization? I know they weren't just the hordes of monsters Anglos have taught me my entire life. Yeah, it's like you have to understand dialectics. You have to understand that the inadvertent result of the Mongol conquests was basically integrating the abstraction, the nomadicism posed to sedentary civilizations, strictly as far as the abstraction of space is concerned, that these are just nomads who don't belong to any specific territory, but belong to the abstract territory, the steppe lands that are between civilizations. That level of abstraction had become an object of statehood, which means, for the first time, states are defining their territories in discrete and definite ways. They're drawing a line. They didn't do that before. They said, this exactly is our territory, right? That exactitude and certainty comes from the abstraction that the nomads basically imposed to the sedentary civilizations. The abstraction acquires the quality of universality strictly through an exhausting, a kind of eastern closure of the frontier. The Mongols basically conquered the world, at which point it was not possible to really be nomadic anymore. Suddenly, the whole world is under the blue sky of Tengri. You can't be a nomad anymore. Now you are definitely a part of some kind of civilization. However, this civilization, being the heir of the rule of Genghis Khan, for whom the entire world is under his dominion, each civilization, from the Mughals to the Safavids to the Turks, the Ottomans, I mean, to the uh, Russians, to the Chinese, now buy for that universality. Even though their territory does not encompass the entire world, the abstraction of the world as some kind of limitless territory defines the conception of political space. They become universal empires in this strict sense. Universal in the sense of uh, defining their boundaries abstractly. By the way, when you define your boundaries abstractly, suddenly what defines a member of your civilization also becomes abstract, or at least becomes universal in some sense. Your political sovereignty is no longer defined strictly by a certain religion or a certain ethnicity or a certain group, but has as its object some kind of universal humanity that cuts across all of those things. Now, the, the important question is this, how does that universality of the Mongols differ from the one of the European Enlightenment. To me, the lost Mongol universalism was an abstraction towards the benefit of the doubt, which means it doesn't mean we assume all of humanity is an indiscriminate abstraction devoid of roots and culture and differences and so on. It's just that we won't make assumptions about them in our state. We will let those differences arise organically. And in this way, there's a unity between the universal and the particular, where you're not making any assumptions about the nature of the state, but suddenly you start to be assimilated, you, the Mongol conqueror, in the Yuan dynasty. And suddenly these Mongol rulers start to assimilate and be become civilized by the civilization below. It's determinate universality. It's still leaving room and space for dialogue and understanding and change with other cultures and fusion, but it's somehow acquiring a determinate form, always already remit with a determinate form. The European universality rather tries to ground its universality by eliminating the particularity that grounds it and replacing it with one that's contrived by the state itself. But if you want a quick answer, I mean, the Mongols, if you look at the cities that were the fruit of the Mongol Empire, if you look at their contributions uh, in the form of the science and technology and intellect, and literature and art, Silk Road and the flourishing that came with that. I mean, some of the greatest and most beautiful cities in the history of mankind are the legacy of the Mongols and the heirs of the Mongols, Timurids. It's not the Mongols that, to me, have the most privileged significance. I'm a Hegelian, so for me as a Hegelian, something to have privileged significance only takes form when it repeats. It has to happen twice. History must happen twice for it to be significant. It's the Timurids. It's Timur. Timur, the heir of Genghis Khan, who wanted to repeat what Genghis Khan did and uh, revive the Mongol Empire. That is where uh, the Mongol modernity that I talk about comes the most apparent. So Timur, not Genghis, is my hero. Well, Genghis is my hero as well, but Timur is my... Uh, my idol is Timur.